Chapter 10, Beetle Mountain. That's the window, Dark has pointed up through the branches of the sycamore tree. We need to climb up to the branch opposite and jump in. He looked at his shoulder. Baxter, you can fly up. I'm still not sure about this, Bert old clutched Virginia. I'm not very good at heights. Don't you want to see, Bertolt nodded reluctantly. Yes, but. What's the worst that could happen? We get in there and it turns out to be only a handful of ordinary beetles in a teacup. No, Bertolt looks sombre. We fall and break our necks and get caught and end up in prison. If we get caught, we'll tell the police we were trying to rescue Darkus. They kidnapped him, remember? And we'll be the heroes. What, what, what if we get kidnapped? Look, they're out. And if they come back... We can be out of the window and down here in seconds, Darkus reassured him, swinging up onto the tree and leaning down to offer Virginia a helping hand. She scoffed at him, wrapping her hands around the lowest branch and walking her feet up the trunk until she could flip into a sitting position beside him. Well, they looked down at Bertolt who was jumping up and down, trying and failing to reach the branch. Virginia and Darkus both leant down, each grabbing hold of one of his hands, and they pulled him up beside them. Thanks, Bertolt pushed his glasses up his nose and gave them an apologetic smile. Darkus went ahead, climbing up to the branch opposite Humphrey's room, and he launched his body through the window. The beetles were hidden away inside their mountain, with only the odd hind leg or antenna visible, and he was relieved to see the pink armchair was still wedged against the door. Hello, Darkus whispered, picking himself off the floor. I'm back. Baxter gently landed on his shoulder. He could hear the quiet scufflings and chitterings as the other beetles began emerging from their mountain. Move over, Virginia was crouching on the window ledge. This window is swarming with ladybirds. I, I, I might just stay here, Bertolt was still clinging onto the branch. Come on. Virginia reached out and Bertold hurled himself into her arms, knocking them both through the window onto the floor. Sorry, whispered Bertold. I'm at a height disadvantage when it comes to trees. It's dark in here, Virginia looked about. There isn't a light, Darkus replied, pointing up at the bulbless fitting dangling from the ceiling. I wish I'd brought my torch gentle buzzing noise answered him and thousands of tiny flickering yellow lights floated up to the ceiling. Wow! Darkus looked up. Peeny woollies! Virginia gasped. Peeny what? Darkus asked. Fireflies, Virginia said, her eyes shining. Our very own starlight! Fireflies, Bertold echoed. Now they're beautiful. Welcome to Deep Beetle Mountain, Darkus proudly stepped over to the towering mound, enjoying the expressions on Virginia's and Bertold's faces as hundreds of beetles poked their heads out of their cups. Baxter flew up and landed on the butterfly bush. Whoa, those are 
big beetles. Virginia moved to take a closer look. Freeze, Darkers pointed. Look down. The floor in front of her feet might have looked like a carpet, but it was, Darkers knew, a live tapestry of beetles weaving in and out of each other. Oh, what do I do? She asked Darkus. Darkus knelt down. Please, can you let my friend through? He asked politely. The beetles at Virginia's feet drew back, parting to create a path. Amazing! She laughed with delight, stepping up gingerly beside him. Darkus pointed out the beetles in the cups discovering that some of them house beetle larvae too. He spotted traces of cranberry juice in several cups and was mesmerised by the turquoise and caramel mould growths springing up between the various pieces of crockery. He resisted the urge to poke them but noticed that different types of beetle furnished their cups with different things like twigs or water, or even an old sock. My brother Sean is going to die when I tell him about this, Virginia said, peering into the cups. Look, an elderberry beetle, and she pointed at the black beetle, with absurdly long antennae and electra that had a rim of bright gold. Whoa, these are seriously endangered species. And oh, there's a stag beetle and an oil beetle. This room should be a conservation zone. Uh, uh, um, guys, Bertold's voice had shot up an octave. Help, he squeaked. Relax, we hear the front door go if they come back, Darker says. No, look, Bertold rolled his eyes up to the ceiling. Beetle! I know, Virginia smiled at the fireflies. Flies. Aren't they stunning? No, Bertold wailed. On my head! Wowzers, what is that? Virginia exclaimed. It's enormous, is it? Bertold looked like he might faint. Resting on his white blonde curls was the enormous zebra-striped beetle. It's all right, Darkus smiled. It's a Goliath. I met him yesterday. He won't hurt you. Get it off me. Bertold pleaded. Gently, Darkus held his hand against Bertold's forehead and the huge beetle crawled onto it. Bertold slumped against the wall with his eyes closed, sighing with relief. Until he opened them again and he found a cluster of mint green lavender beetles feeding off a tea splatter right in front of his nose. He sprang back with a shriek. <gasps> Virginia tutted. Stop being so jumpy or I'll, you'll squash someone. Come on, surely you're smart enough to see how these, how amazing these guys are. Bertus looked down, Bertold looked down, very shamefaced. Sorry. Oh, look, dung beetles, Virginia pointed. Oh, no, yuck, grimaced Bertold. Look what they're pushing. Darker saw a brown cricket ball roll out of a hole in the skirting board, steered by two bronze beetles. One beetle was working heroically hard, walking in a kind of handstand and pushing the ball with his hind legs, whilst the other was pretending to help, but really sitting on top and getting a free ride. Ooh, 
Do you think it's human poo? Bertold asked. What other kinds of poo do you think they have around here? Virginia chuckled at Bertold's horror. Oh, come on. We all do it. And if the beetles didn't get rid of it, we'd probably all be wading around in it. She looked around the room, taking in the dirty armchair, the axe and the wooden chair with ropes wound its, round its legs. Everything you said was true, she said to Darkus. I thought you said you believed me. Well, I did, sort of, she shook her head in wonder. But this is bonkers. I know, he, odded, he nodded. These beetles are like no beetles I've ever seen before. He gently placed the Goliath beetle on the mountain. And they need our help. They're in danger. Baxter dropped down from the butterfly bush and crawled to the Goliath beetle, his antennae flicking in silent conversation. But Virginia shook her head. Beetles, <clears throat> beetles don't have a hive of mentality. They don't behave the way you're talking about it, working together. Well, maybe these ones do. He looked at his friends. Something important is happening in this room. I don't know what it is exactly, but I know we have to protect these beetles. It's what Dad would do. Are you going to tell your uncle about this place? Bertold asked. I don't know, Darkus frowned. Not yet. I think you should, Bertold said quietly. A loud bang sounded downstairs and they looked at each other in alarm. Blood-curdling laughter echoed up the stairwell. What do you look like? Humphrey roared. Me? Pickering snapped. Take a look in the mirror and you'll see that satin highlights your talent your for sweating like a warthog. Well, your tie looks like a monkey spewed bananas on it. Monkey, uh, Humphrey snorted. The cousins were back. Goosebumps popped up all over Darkus's body. Time to get out of here, he whispered urgently. We don't want to get caught. He held his hand out to Baxter, who flew straight to it. They ran to the window. Virginia clambered onto the window ledge and leaning out, caught hold of the branch. She swung down and dropped to the ground. Oh, what? What if I can't reach? Bertold clung to the window frame in fear. You'll be fine, Darkus said. You just give yourself a good push off. Bertold screwed up his courage, closed his eyes and flung himself off the window ledge with his arm thrown wide like a flying squirrel. He overshot the first branch, screaming as he hit the second, grabbing onto it for dear life. Virginia was up the tree in a shot, grabbing onto Bertold and helping him down to the ground. Back to base camp, she pushed him. Quick! Hey! You made a noise like an air raid siren just now, so get on your knees and get under that table fast before we're seen. Bertold crawled into the tunnel. A firefly appeared before him, lighting the way. Darkus was shimmying down the tree, Baxter on his shoulder, when a window opened one floor down from the Beetle Mountain. The cousins were in the kitchen and he froze. Pickering's head poked out. I definitely heard something. No, you didn't, came Humphrey's voice. Yes, I did, Pickering scanned the yard. There's someone out there. Darkus held his breath. Don't look up. Don't look up. It was probably a fox. Humphrey's head poked, popped out the window beside Pickering's. 
can't see anything except a yard full of rubbish. It's not rubbish, Pickering shouted, slamming the window shut. Darkus dropped down to the ground and crawled as fast as he could into the furniture forest. Berthold and Virginia were waiting for him outside. Come on, let's get to base camp, he said. Wait, where does that door go? Virginia point, then pointed to a shabby wooden door on the other side of the tree, partly obscured by the stack of furniture. I don't know, Darkus admitted out of breath. I've never noticed it before. It could be a way into the boarded up shop. Then we don't want to go through it, Berthold looked at Darkus, clearly hoping he'd agree. Do we? Because we'd be, we'd be in their building and they're back home now. It's probably locked, said Darkus. It might not be, Virginia cocked her head. If we are going to protect these beetles, we need to identify all the possible escape routes out the building in case Lucretia Cutter shows up. Darkus nodded. OK, let's take a look. Before anyone could protest, he was dashing back across the yard, Baxter still on his shoulder. When he reached the door, he twisted the door handle and pulled. The swollen wood popped out of the door frame with a grunt. Darkus held his thumbs up and slipped inside. Berthold groaned as Darkus disappeared. You stay here, Virginia said, wriggling past him. Be our lookout. OK, Berthold said, looking very relieved. If you see them coming, create, create a diversion so we can get out. Virginia peeped out from under the table. Wait, Berthold blinked frantically. What, what, what kind of um, diversion? We'll do something noisy. Push that stack of chairs over. And she looked, launched herself after Darkus. Berthold looked up at the firefly hovering above his head. I'm the lookout, he said. Virginia found herself standing on a black and white checked lino floor at the entrance to a dingy kitchenette. To her right was a neglected toilet. In the floor in front of it was a manhole cover. Oh, wonder if that goes down to the sewers, she thought, remembering the dung beetles. She stepped over the manhole cover into the kitchen. A Belfast sink sat below a dark window, the light blocked by furniture outside. Opposite was a built-in cupboard with a threadbare floral apron hanging from the hook on the door. Darkus, she called out. Where are you? Here. His voice came from an archway to the left. Come and look at this. He was in the middle of a shop floor, surrounded by a mess of sewing machine parts. A blue sign. Fanny's fluters knitting and stitching emporium lay beside a shattered display case that held a cobwebbed covered ball of yellow wool. On the wall behind the till in enormous dripping red letters was the word pies. Scrawled underneath in spidery black marker pen were the words make you fat. There was evidence of insect life everywhere chair legs had been eaten away until they looked like burnt matchsticks. Dark 
exoskeletons scurried in and out of nooks and crannies, glistening in the half-light as they trundled about their business. Darkus looked past Virginia. Where's Bertold? Being our lookout. We don't want to get caught in here. Darkus nodded. If we could get that open, he pointed to the shop door, we'd have an escape route into the street. He went over to the door, pulled back the bolts and tried it, but it was locked. Don't suppose you can pick locks? She shook her head. Darkus rose up on tiptoe and ran his fingers along the top of the door frame. He stopped and grinned, pulling out a key from the cobwebs. Dad keeps a spare key above the door for forgetful days, he said, slotting the dusty key into the lock and turning it. The lock opened. Yes, he whispered, yanking the door open an inch, stopping it before it hit the gold bell hanging from the ceiling. Virginia felt, held up her hand to give him a high five. It took an awkward second before Darkus realised what she was doing and lifted his own hand to meet hers. Closing and locking the door, he pocketed the key and followed Virginia back into the kitchen. Opening the cupboard with the apron on the door, she whispered to him, Look at this! Inside was a staircase. Leaning their heads into the stairwell, they heard Pickering and Humphrey's voices. I have Lucretia Cutter's card and the Beatles are mine, Humphrey shouted. They're in my room, therefore they belong to me. There was an almighty crash of crockery. It leads up to the kitchen, Virginia mouthed. You've forgotten something, Pickering's voice was dripping with acid. We can get your door open. We can't get your door open. And unless I'm mistaken, there's a boy tied up and gagged in there. I wonder what the police would say if someone told them about that. But you did it. Ah, but he's in your room. And he'll remember you wanted to bake him in a pie. I'm sure the police would be interested. That's murder, that is. Humphrey growled. All I'm suggesting is that we work together, Pickering said. You've tried to break the door down, but it won't budge, and my axe is in there. Which means the only way in is through the window. So, unless you want to carry on sleeping on the hall floor, you're going to need my help getting in. Pickering sounded very triumphant. If I get in and dispose of the boy, then we both do the deal with Lucretia Cutter. What do you say? There was a pause. Deal, said Hen Humphrey reluctantly. As long as I get to make him into a pie. Virginia closed the cupboard door. Let's get out of here. 